Well, I think painting, watercolour painting especially, is the, is the most um, exciting thing that's ever come into my life. Um, I started, well, ten years ago, but um, um, I find I'm almost like, a, instead of being an alcoholic, I'm a watercolour addict. And um, I find I've only got to get a sheet of paper in front of me and some paints, and it's like leaping into a great adventure to me. You either um, make a complete failure of it, or it's just like a one-armed bandit. You see, you pull the lever, and uh, anything can happen. You can either um, make a complete failure, or you can uh, have a fairly good painting, or you can sometimes hit the jackpot and have a beautiful one, or it's like the hitting the, you know. But um, to me, it's it's a great adventure every time I touch a piece of paper. A lot of the way I, I paint, I think, is just, just common sense. It's not academic. I'm rather like a, um, a pianist who plays by ear at a sort of stand-up piano. And um, if people like the music that comes out, fine. But if you said what chord was that you played or what colour combination, I don't know. It's just, it's just rather like uh, it's uh, sounded right. So I'm a really a much uh, seat-of-the-pants painter. And if you like it, it's fine. If you don't, well, that's great, you know. <laughs> I think watercolour uh, lent itself so well to pertain water. I'm immersed in water almost, you see. I, I've only got to get into the river and there it is. Um, I love reflections. Uh, watercolour looks beautiful wet into wet. And this is where um, it, 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 it's best, I think. I mean, it doesn't work sometimes with seascapes so well um, because I think they're better put in oils. You know, they're more... Um, um, but um, rivers, streams, lakes, even ditches, I find that uh, I'm fascinated with them and I, um, I, I can never pass one without wanting to paint it. <laughs> A lot of my paint people that uh, come to me and, and uh, learn and read my book are well into the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and they haven't time to go through this all long rigmarole of evening classes and uh, art schools or anything like that. They want to learn to paint reasonably well, r very quickly. And this is my whole philosophy, is to sort of take them by the hand and say, come on, follow me, I, you know, this is great fun. Just leap in with me and enjoy it. And luckily, thousands of people seem to be enjoying it. And this is what my whole purpose in life is to, to give over as much pleasure to people, as, as much as telling them, teaching them to paint, is giving them pure pleasure.
Right, come have a look at this. Right, well that's a lovely scene there, look. You see, it's all simplified. Um, we're going to work from the back to the front. In other words, put the sky in first, and then we'll put the, that whole hillside and gradually work forward from back to the back yes. to the front. Yes. And actually finishing up this tree there at the last mm. last thing, you see. Mm. Yeah, well, out of that thing, I think we need about uh, six colours. Um, yeah, we'll get those six colours out. Well, I find with um, materials, some people think they're going to solve all the problems in the painting by buying, more, buying and buying more and more things, more colours, more palettes, more brushes, and so they're surrounded by this um, almost complex uh, materials. I, my whole philosophy is to cut down everything to the very bare minimum so that you've only got to use seven colours and uh, you, you find that you get to know those rather like friends instead of a lot of acquaintances and you know exactly how they're going to um, react with each other. I can almost mix my paints without looking at them because I've got so few to work with and I've got them so much in my mind. Thank you. Yeah. So just four colours at the moment. No, I'm using the whole six because I've got little things I want to use. Taking as much brown and a tiny bit of alizarin crimson just to put the sky in. Right. Okay, that's about it. That's all we need. I think this gives room for moving the, the paint around in the mm. middle, you see. Now let's come to the colours themselves. Um, I've only got seven. These seven colours are all I ever use. There's a raw sienna, first of all. This is a, my bank. I use it on everything. Um, lemon yellow is a, a right down bright yellow. Ultramarine, again, a bright blue. Burnt umber, or the brown, light red, alizarin crimson, and paint grey. You notice I haven't got any green in the palette at all, in, the, in my uh, palette at all, because I make them all up myself. So let's show you roughly how I get a range of greens just from these three colours ultramarine, lemon yellow, and raw sienna. So let's start off with a, a blue here. That's, that's, that's straightforward blue, but touch a bit of lemon yellow into it and you get a sort of very pale bluey green. Let's drop that, you see. That's the sort of most distant green, very pale. OK, let's put a bit more colour into it. Just watch the palette and you can see how the colours change. By adding more yellow, you get um, a richer green, a bit more yellow here. You see? And then the next stage is about add more yellow still. And you're getting absolutely. Can you see the difference as it gets more yellow still? You see Betty getting richer, richer and richer. Now, if you want to add a bit of raw sienna, you get a richer colour still. It's a, it's a more... There we are. Now, let's have it... Say you want a, a very dark... a very dark... green, like the sort of thing you get under the trees. Now, I use lemon yellow and paint grey for that. See the lovely rich greens you can get. See all that range of greens but with these very few colours. Try it yourself and, and really learn to get over this fear of greens. And that's a very dark green. Now say so we're doing... Let's start... Show you a little bit clearer. Let's start as a distant wood, say. You sort of start here. And then as they come towards you a bit more.
You can see how the, the colours are changing all the time um, just by the different amounts of yellows and blues I put with them. See, that looks much nearer than that, you see. OK, that's basically the, the greens. If you can get this feeling uh, of, of from pale blue distant, pale blue distant um, trees, you know, the ones you see at five miles away, they, they really look almost blue. Right, let's have an example, you know, show you an example of what I mean. Uh, this is the distant stuff about a, a mile away, which, which is almost pure blue, but it, or because it's a green tree, but it's, it's almost pure blue. Then as it gets nearer, the, the they get more and more uh, yellow in them, you see, until they get quite rich here. This is the nearer colour, and as we get nearer still, we come onto the very rich greens. So you can see the, the difference between those two areas. Both of them are probably the same trees, but because one's uh, a few feet and the other one's half a mile away, they have this, uh, what I call, aerial perspective in them. And you can get that by the different amounts of blue and yellow you use. Ultramarine and burnt umber. Um, they make a beautiful range of greys. And also alizarin crimson and Payne's grey, which uh, I love for making rich mauves for the skies and things. Let me just show you uh, those two. Um, ultramarine and burnt umber. You know, they make lovely range of greys, you see. Let's, let's show you. That's, that's the blue. And that, uh, introduce the brown. A bit more blue. And halfway between the brown and the blue, you've got a lovely... Look at this. Well, you had a bit stronger. So you can make a tremendous difference by the amount of, of um, colour you get. You see? Now let's do the... Again, paint grey is a nasty colour by itself. It's a slaty, slaty colour, but I found mixing it with a bit of alizarin crimson just to warm it up. And you get a lovely, a lovely effect. Especially useful for skies. Thing I want to show you in a minute how I do use it for skies, the underneaths of clouds, you see. There's two different greys there all together. Right. Well, I've just sketched the thing in very roughly. I haven't put any detail in, but it just shows the areas of the sky, the hillside, yes. the river, just, just to give it some idea where I'm going. OK, well, we start off, of course, by the... Uh, from the farthest thing, which is the sky. So I'm going to put the sky in first, get the rough idea of a little bit of raw sienna in, just, just plain to sort of lubricate the whole thing. Like that, you see? Very, very nice wash, washed out. Colour. Yes, just washed out to give a... It's all light and airy. And then into that, I put my bits of blue in. See, there's all that lovely yes. blue there. That looks quite bright, but I suppose yes. it, uh, when it's dry, it, it's... You watch this. It's a... The dark part of the sky, the top, and then leaving plenty of those airy Nice little clouds, clouds yes. yes. Little. And into that we just put a little tiny bit of underneath shadow to the, to the, to the clouds. You feel the underneath of them there? Yes, just darker. Mm. That'll all soften as we go along, you know. So it's all very loose, isn't it, really? Yes, just... fresh. That's about it, you see. That will all soften. Mm, that's all you it... need, I see. You see, it, the, the, the business of having very few materials, you use them to the utmost. I mean, the, the, the hake brush, for example, I use the corners, the edge, the flat. Every piece of that brush I use. And the same with the rigger and same with the flat brush, the little one-inch flat brush I use. It's um, you're using to the utmost, squeezing every last drop of, of utility out of each one. 
And, and as you learn to use more things, and, and people say, oh, I never thought of using the corner or the edge or painting it in flat. There are all different ways of using those very few materials, and it, uh, it works. Now, this is what a hake looks like when it's new, and the uh, first time you put it in the water. Um, I must admit, mine doesn't look quite like that. This is, this is, this is my brush, which is uh, worn to a nice sharp edge, and some of the... Uh, little bits of worn off it, but it, it's, a, it's a beautiful brush to work with, even though it doesn't look very pretty. <laughs> I'll say one, two, three at this go. That's not a bad colour, is it? See, there's a whole yeah. lot going over yeah. there. And we then actually dampen it down. It powers more water so that we've got... A very, make it very soft. Like very this. soft. I like a little bit of mist at the bottom here. Put a tiny bit of blue into it. And you can get a bit... I suppose the blue gives the feeling of distance too, doesn't that's it? That's right, yes. See, and that's more or less it for the background. OK. Yeah, looks great. Um, now we'll put this in. You see that area around there, this part here, that goes in, it's, it's nearer, so therefore the paint's got to be a bit mm. stronger and, and richer. And also it, it's going over that wet surface there, so you'll have to make it stronger. Because it, see? Yes. It's quite it's strong paint, paper, that. so... Yes, but it's going into that already wet sky, mm. So it will soften off. It's lovely soft edges, doesn't it? Mm. it there we are. And as it goes a bit further away, we add a bit more blue. Oh, that's coming along mm. beautifully. Yeah. And then that very far distant uh, trees there, it's almost into Which the mist. Bluer still, I suppose. Bluer still, yeah, that's great. Yeah. You see? Yeah. That's it. Now we we'll go over to the the other side a bit. We'll have a bit of bit of, of that grass over there. We'll mix a bit of this in just to put the bank in. Lovely there. All the time. So simpli no, no detail, really. No, it's just simplifying. You can't put use detail no. with this thing. It's just and you put the brush across in the same angle as the There we are. Probably pale this off a bit as well, you see, just to keep it. You don't want too much strength too far away. Right, now we'll go over to this area oh. here, which is the... Are you going to tackle those trees in the same way? Yes. I'm going to worry about getting your hands dirty on this. And that's the bare outline, so I'll take you down to that sharp edge. You see the sharp edge at the mm -hmm. bottom of those trees now? And get those... That's about there. Let me use this little mm. rigger to get a few... Just a few branches, do you put yeah, branches Yeah, to give in? it a bit of delicacy. You use your rigger to just at the end, right at the end... end yes, of the branch, I, I hold you, it. You hold it at the end of the... Yes, so that you don't get too fiddly. We want to get... So you're not worrying about each stage dry, and you're just going no, straight. No, just carry on. Actually. Carry on, and so this is fairly dry here. You've got that nice bit of light it's grass. Quite an intense green, isn't it? There on that grass. It is. That's that the brightest it's green in the picture. The sun's almost. on it. And yeah. yeah. It's very bright and sharp. 
And then as it comes over the, the edge of the bank, it darkens. Mm. But we can... I always think that's very tricky to get these yes. banks you, to give them... You the get, we get the of... air, you get the bank coming down like that, you see. Ah, and then we'll put some more a... stuff on top of that when it's a bit drier. Okay. Right. Good. Get some dark in here now, a little bit of dark. So that you can just drop it into the side of the bank to darken it. Yes. All the time treating it very simply and directly. The next thing we do is the river. I think one of the most difficult things to do in painting is to simplify. I mean, I want to put the essence of the scene in front of me um, on paper so that it's, it's almost like a distillation of what you see in front of you. Um, the most difficult thing to teach people is to say, well, um, what do you leave out? What do you put in? What is the most essential bit and what are the f frills and, and, and crocheting? Uh, and I think a lot of people when they're beginning to paint, in fact, a lot of amateur painters, they they just go on. You've got this little devil for here sitting on your shoulder saying, God, there's a bit you missed there, and I think, uh, you know, you've missed a bit of grass there. And, and you go on and on and on, long after you should have stopped. And I think the, the brushes I use, especially the hake, um, stops you from this awful over-elaboration. So many people say, I, I'd love to, to paint fresh, simple watercolours, but I, I, I keep on going and over overplaying. Another thing I do with my students is to um, um, give them a time limit so that they haven't time to fiddle. And they often, uh, one thing I do on my courses is to give them a half-hour quickie in which they, they've got half an hour to do this painting. I ring a big bell and uh, they, they're working like mad, the adrenaline comes out, and uh, they, they're going at it like the absolute dead silence. And then at the end of the half hour, I ring the bell, and they stand back, and they can't believe they've done such a fresh, simple painting, because um, by the time they've got the little brushes out, the bell's gone, and, and uh, there, there's their fresh painting, which they want to do all the time, but they can't normally. Right, we do the, the river now, but if you look at the river, you can see all these masses of ripples and, and, and little bits of light catching. And if you try to put all those in, the thing would be mm. a, a lot of fuss and rubbish. So what you do, treat it like as if it was a soft mirror, what's above it. You see, everything that's up there has got to be shown down there. OK, so what I'm going to do is put virtually a, a blue sky across that very, very lightly with a very... to give it... To lubricate the river, if you like, we'll lubricate bit, the water. A very wet wash, then. Yes, but very lightly put over. So one, two, three. You see, That's very. Get some sparkle because I'm putting it so lightly. Oh, I yes. get the sparkle so in it. Picking up the ripples yeah. quite so naturally. I'm going to leave those there. I'm not going to sort of fuss them. I'm going to leave as much as I can there. That's nice. 
because of course mm. the river reflects what's that's above really the it sky. The sky yes. Now this has got to go in. You see the reflection mm. of that. So we, is this a thicker, a thicker, a thicker mix, version? So, but mm. that's this going in. Mm -hmm. I hope it'll go in first time. One, two, three. Yes, you see, that's the... That's very bold. That's bold. It's got to be bold. That's the reflection mm. of that, you see. Well, I'm not going to fuss it again. I should stop it. Um, and then into this, I've got to put that, some of that in. A bit of lemon yellow and lemon yellow and paint grey, which is virtually just to, to put the reflections of, of that bit of wood in there, you see. and then fade it off as it comes down there. And then you put these trees in. First of all, you want a little bit of the pale green to, to reflect the bank underneath yes, here. I'm not even bright, looking at the, the, the picture in front of me. I know what I've got to put mm. in. Mm. If I looked at the picture, um, it would probably confuse mm. me of the actual scene. That's very effective but already. Yeah. important to mm -hmm. put them opposite where the reflection's in. I've seen so many times where people don't do this and, and it sort of looks, they let the reflection slip about 50 yards up the road. You see, it's just... Great. Pop it in like that. And then we... Uh, let's touch a little bit in here, where the edge of the water is. You've left this bit quite wide. Oh, I always do that. It's one of my little... Shine like gimmicks. Now this is the bit I like, putting the shine on the water. As long as you don't fuss it, you can put a, a lovely shine just by going out like that, you see. You've got to get that right first yeah, time. Yeah, first time. There's no good fussing it like I did then. <laughs> and the same thing here. You just go one, two, three. It's a lovely bit of glint there. Yes. You just go with a, with a sort of slightly damp brush. You just go woof. So you must take that out when the when the When it's damp, still, yes, that's damp. right. And just mm -hmm. lift it out with, on, with a sort of almost clean brush, you see and don't over fuss it, just keep it. And really, basically, that's, that's the, the water finished, you see. Now, if you look at that, you see there's so many little bits of glitters, oh, but yes, you, know, you could go and say, well, there's a bit there, there's a bit there, there's a bit there. Mm. And that's what you've got to do, is capture this peaceful scene, mm. not every, because as your wind catches the bits of water, it moves around, but you've got the peace of that river, and that's mm. what you're after. That's great. Right. OK, now we do the foreground. Now, the big mistake most people make with the foreground is that they fuss it too much. They get the rest of the painting OK, and suddenly they go mad, and they don't know what to do with it, and, thing. and um, you know, they, they, just, they just fuss it and work at it too much. So we want to keep it quite a sweep, simple sweep of grass here, and just a few bits on the end. Now, what you want is a nice rich green for this foreground, you know, a bit of nice blue, a bit of yellow, and then just to warm up a bit, a bit of raw sienna, and you've got a lovely rich green there. So, OK, now put it on. See how nice and mm. rich it is? So let's say one, two, three. Go. Put it on and, and leave it. You know, don't fuss it. Tell the toad tape to poke about with it. And, and so that's, that's more or less That looks it. very simple. It's yes, it is. Simple. Now, we'll get some of these um, dark bits in up here. Uh, we're perhaps about there, so we get a bit of brown, a bit of paint grey, just something good and dark just to get over here. Again, don't fuss it, just put it in and leave it, you know, as soon as you've got... It's just an impression of yeah. what's there. And then from there on you go over the... the um, Mm -hmm. the rigger uh -huh. here. This is where the rigger comes in. So useful. This, all those lovely delicate bits of, of um, rushes and things. It's just to, let's just have go with it. There's some nice ones here. It gives a nice contrast mm -hmm. to all the softness. Mm -hmm. Get something. You mustn't have everything soft. Like some people get through, like they love this wet to wet, and they get carried away with it. You're u um, using quite dark paint there, aren't you? Well, it is dark. Look at those... Mm. Um, I mean, those brushes are... Or brushes, or what they are. 
but it's nice sort of it's not grass it's it's really strong you can mix a bit of grass with it as well because it throws everything else into the background mm. nicely it gives a nice feeling to it you can just touch a bit of something else in here but this is where you've got to be careful to perhaps a bit bit in there I suppose it would be easy to overdo it at the stage. Oh gosh, yes. That's, that's a tiny bit of darker texture in here if you want to. This is the danger part. Mm. I think that looks just fine. That's enough. That's enough. Don't do any more. <laughs> well, you can flick a little bit with your fingers here, like that, just to sort of get a bit of. See, but not too much of that either. It's. Uh, yeah, so you've got to be like bold. A, that's really? bold but simple. Let's leave it at that. Now we're all ready for the tree in front there. Right, now we've got this foreground tree. Now this is a very daunting prospect, That's you know, it's the real nitty-gritty yes. now. Yes. Um, but don't avoid it. I mean, it, it's, it, you can kind of get so far and say, oh, well, well, probably leave it. I might spoil it with the tree. No, but the tree is a wonderful thing there to, to, to have a go at. Um, you've got to look at it first, spend about two minutes looking at it and finding out what its characteristics are, you know, where, where the branches grow. But you can't get all of it in, can you? Because no, I'm just going to get just... half of it. I'm going to actually push it in a bit mm. so I can get it. Um, I'm not going to try and get the whole tree in, but mm. just around there would be rather nice. Mm. Right, we get some good, rich, juicy things in like this. Going sideways with a brush, you know, you can get much more sort of character to it. Um, get the main chunky stuff in there. and we can go into the fine stuff later but it's it's getting establishing this you really need to be sure of what you're going to do before you start well you've got to paint it in with a, a certain amount of authority mm. you know i've got to try and i mean i know the roughly the, the area i want to get and because uh, there's lovely ivy on top as well which i can put in there but basically you're just going to the main chunky stuff in because there. it dries out quite a bit it, isn't yeah. it? Now into that you've got to put this nice sort of bit of ivy stuff in here. You can just mix it up and you know, just put it in here and a bit more and up here. Just using the corner of the to follow it too. No, I'm just going to get given get in the atmosphere of the thing now. Yeah? Um, even here you've got some ivy growing up there. And it still looks a bit stark now, but Okay, I think that shows the, the main. Now I turn over to the to the rigger. Right. The big thing is to get the transition right between the uh, the chunky stuff and the delicate yes. bits. Um, so we press on hard. This is the thing about I'm holding the brush very high up on the handle, and now we start to get into so you that. Use much more pressure to start. Much, with, oh, yeah, terrific pressure at the beginning to get that. Off. You see, you can yes. get some very strong stuff here, get as, as thick as that. This is where I'm, it's my main um, structure. See, here's one coming down here, for example. You don't have to follow it exactly, do you? No, I you just let the, just the, the, the uh, brush have as its head. It's all that I could, mm. as a dog with a long lead. You don't have I to follow I suppose if you try to follow the tree too closely, then it becomes rather stiff Oh, yeah, stiff I don't, I'm not even looking unnatural. at the tree at the moment. I'm just constructing something here, which is... Uh, and still using the same colour. Yes, I'm trying to get a... See, now I'm just going to start filling in. There's the main structure. That's going to hold the tree up in a, in a high wind. And yes. then I can sort of start getting the, the smaller stuff in afterwards. But it's this, this the, uh, there's another bit there. That's going to come down like that. You're going to have a bit of confidence in this. This is where you need all sorts of practice with, with the rigger. You see, it's... Just letting it. You really just need to practice doing lots and lots of trees. If that's you're right. You can just ruin the picture if you don't. Uh, you know, you can ruin this whole picture, this stage, if you don't know what you're doing. Um, this is why it's so important to practice this damn thing. It really is. It's beginning to, to, to pull pull together now. And the more you do it, the more it'll. Uh, Look. And you're still using that rigger at the, right at the top, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, right at the top and... OK.
Right, well that is the uh, rigger uh, finished there, you see. What I want to do now is, you see those little um, tiny twigs at the end, of the, which you can't do as over the rigger, they're too small. So what you do is get a very, very dry brush. So and very little paint on your brush. Very, hardly anything at all, just a mm. dirty brush virtually. Mm. And just with, with a very fine, uh, this again what most people do is too, 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 too wet. What I'm going to do is just to stroke the thing. It's no good being heavy handed then. No, yeah. you've got to stroke it so gently, hardly touching the paper at all, you see. Just give this little hazy feel mm. about her, uh, as if it's fine twigs, you see. Just fill them Just in, at yeah. the very ends of the ranches? Yes, yeah, just the very ends, and hardly touch the paper at all. And it's just giving that appearance of, of uh, the twig ends, of the branch ends, a little bit here. And if you do it too heavy, you've got to test it a bit on a mm. bit of paper first, we'll use it. Again, I think you'd need a lot of practice to get that right. Yeah, so you want to try it on a bit of paper, and so you don't... Um, that's too heavy, you see. But I think that's more or less it now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's done it. Looks very good. Right, what do you think? I think that's terrific. I think you've, you've done enough now. Yes, I should you, leave it there. You always, everybody needs somebody to stop them because they, you go on and on poking little bits and you think, oh no, it's a, a great temptation. Yeah, now we must stop. It looks all right. Let's go have, back and have some lunch, shall we? <laughs> right, let's um, show you some of the materials. Well, most people, when they start, they seem to acquire a scruffy little paint pot like this, you see. Um, very hard pans. They probably borrow it first because they don't, they don't quite know whether they're going to like it or not. And then they get some scruffy little boxes like, little uh, brushes like that. And um, they scrub away at these hard pans and it doesn't seem to work properly. So they, they give up. You know, it's, uh, they think, well, watercolour is too, watercolour is too difficult. So, but I've devised a whole new set of materials. Um, first of all, to get over all these faults that most beginners have, the, the fiddling and the, the poking about and this the sort of um, general feeling of um, bittiness, you know. Um, my colours first, let's talk about these. These are large fat tubes of paint but they don't cost as much as the small artist colours that everybody's told to buy, you must have the very best colours. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, once they get them, they're so afraid to use them. They've cost a lot of yes, money. Yes, that's right. They are that's expensive. Right. And, um, but these are very much cheaper, and you get about five times yes. as much. Now, nothing against artist colours, except for this inhibiting factor. And uh, people should get the little squid at the top of them, put a little tiny bit like that, and they put it right back in the box again. And, uh, you know, there's nothing to work with there. They try to do a sky, and they put piles of water in. So I try to use as much colour as I can, you know. So there's my seven colours, only seven colours, because it gives you less decisions to make, and you can use treat them rather like old friends, that you get to know exactly how we're reactive with each other. It's no good if you have five blues and four reds, yes, and yes. you don't know where you are. Um, now, the brushes themselves, these are a peculiar set of brushes, but they work, um, especially with beginners, because, as I said, one of the faults with beginners is to uh, fiddle too much, to, to um, uh, incline to poke little things. Now this stops you from fiddling, it's, it's an enormous brush, but I'll show you in a minute, it, it really does wonders, it'll do skies, you use the corners, the edges, and, and you can do fantastic things with this brush. Now the other brush I use in conjunction with it is a thing called a rigger. Um, very, very fine, very long haired, and I hold it right at the very top like that. So a lot of my paintings, I just use those two brushes, nothing else. Mm. Um, if I've got um, some sharp edge things like chairs or roofs or boats, anything like that, I use this, which has got a lovely sharp edge to it. And that's all I use. Those seven colours, those two brushes. Now we come to the palettes. Now to get, it's no good having a tiny little pokey palette because you couldn't use this anyway. Um, and I can't find what I want in art shops, so I go to uh, um, hardware stores. And that's cost me about a pound, plastic 
a TV tray, or whatever they like to call it. Gives you plenty of room to. Uh, yes, an enormous room. amount of room yes. to. You can see what you're doing, you know. Um, so you, you use that in conjunction with those three. Um, if I'm outside, of course, I use this little folding um, water jar, which I hang on my palette, and then after you've finished it, you throw it away like that. But if I'm inside, I use this big. Uh, in the studio, I use this big, um, almost like a goldfish mm. bowl. Again, piles of water, a bit, a bit larger than life, mm. you see. But all through those those materials, um, get over this fear and help people to lose their inhibitions. Which I'm, this is a whole idea mm. of my painting courses and my um, way of painting is to is to um, broaden everybody's thing, make the things much more mm. fun. Right now to the paper. Um, a lot of people do this stretching business, which is, means wetting the whole paper and then putting tape on it and waiting mm. it overnight to dry. And of course, when it's, it's like tight as a drum, and to me, it's so inhibiting, you know, um, terrifying. It's stuff. very fiddly as well. Yeah, and I think um, uh, this a piece of paper like that you paid good money for. It's hard enough to sort of start it anyway. Yes. But um, I use this booking foot, which is a, an 140 pounds stuff. So it's, you can. It's quite you, thick. Yes, yes, it doesn't cockle. You can put piles of water on it, and uh, nothing happens to it at all. And it's a good, sound, no-nonsense paper. Um, so that's that's all I use on, on the paper side. Now to a few faults in, in, in composition. Um, you, you find often a, a sequence like this has no verticals in at all. The whole thing is horizontal and there's nothing really to focus your eye on at, at all. But if you um, move over to the, the other one, you find there's a, a vertical here which helps to um, to make the composition more interesting also gives it a foreground interest. Now, another um, usual subject here, river scene. Um, there's no real object of interest there, main object of interest. Um, it, find, it often helps if you can get either a, um, a windmill or a little yacht or, or something that just to give your eye something to focus on to start off with, you see. Now this is one of the real faux pas in, in composition. Having two main objects of interest here and here of both of um, equal size and vying for attention. Your eye tends to, to, to bob backwards and forwards between the two. This could be two ships, two, two um, trees or anything like that. Now if you go over to here, you'll find that I've made one tree a little bit bigger and the other one smaller. So there's no uh, there's no contention now. This is the main object and that's a small one. And you, your, your eye knows exactly where you are with it, you see. Another thing you should never do is to, um, visually, is to chop your picture absolutely in half with your horizon there. You say you've got equal amounts top and bottom. Um, it chops it, the whole picture in half. Now, by raising or lowering the, the horizon, depending on whether it wants to be a uh, a sky, um, a sky picture, or a more of a foreground. But you find that either one or the other, lower it down to there or raise it up. Okay. Lastly, uh, another thing which you should never do is to put your main object of interest, say a church, absolutely dead in the centre of a picture. Uh, you should always either uh, move it what to one side or the other, like this. You see. In that case, it's on the, on the left, it could be the other way around, but um, it's much better to do that. Um, you'll see in, a, in a, a typical scene of a barn here, for example, um, the, the tones are all wrong here. You've got the same tone here and here and there and here. It's all rather monotonous and not very good. And also the sky, of course, is too light and the, the foreground is too dull. You know, in other words, this is what the typical scene you will see at the beginning. Now, I've just done a sketch here um, in where I've sorted out some of the values a bit better. You've got the roof is counterchanged against the, the trees behind it and that is a different tone to that part. And all the way, we've tried to sort out the, the tone values. To make it more interesting, I put a bit of light coming in through here um, with a dark shadow. And I've darkened the sky. And again, to make the foreground more interesting, I put a couple of sheep in there. Now, 
this is the result. This is, you can see much better now the, the tone value. Each tone is different, you see, so that you've got it much simpler to follow. Um, this light through here, um, I've counterchanged a sheep there and another one across here. And there's a lot of faults people do with trees, uh, of putting branches on the outside of the tree instead of putting them in the holes where the birds fly through. All these sort of things um, you've got to get over, but um, it's really tackling the trees as broad masses rather than try to put every leaf and twig in, which is a terrible temptation to do. Get the, the essence of the tree, whether it's a, um, a Spanish oak or a... Or, um, fir tree. You know, you've got to try and get this, uh, the simplicity and the character of each, each tree. Well, take those, uh, that tree over there, for example. We can get the, the main foliage in quite, quite quickly. We've got to get the silhouette of it, really. You can see the shape of it, so we're, we're going there. Uh, Nice thick paint. Nice thick paint. Because you've got a lot of the, so you get the, the feeling of it, the general silhouette, the framework, just like this. Got a bit of dark underneath where the shadows are. And we can use the, the other part here to, to, to get the branches. The paint's not really runny, it's, it's, no, it's, that's it's thick the, enough to... Uh, it's thick enough to, to stay where it's put. Mm. You know, you're, getting, you're getting the feel mm. of that. Mm. This is all with the first brush. You know, you can put the lighter bits in with the, with the more delicate one. We've got the main sort of skeleton. That's right. Now we get this little brush here and we put in the little fiddly bits. It's a combination of these two brushes, it is magic. Because you mm. can get all the fine all these odd yes. broken branches and things like that. Just build it up. Yeah. Then. And you've got the characteristics yeah. of it, you see? Right, now take that tree over there, which is a completely different thing. That's, that's obviously a, um, bare branches, but you, you can build the thing up just the same way, but you work mainly as... There's no actual foliage on it, but you can get the... Bare bone. Now you've got to have the structure yes. first. It's no good yes. putting yes. a long trunk and then 20 foot high twigs, which yes. is what a lot of people do. They just say, oh well, there's the trunk in, now we'll put the twigs in. And you've got to have this So that it shape. actually stands up. Absolutely, it. otherwise it would blow over in the first yes. wind that came along. You see, there's your main structure. Now you're going into the smaller, smaller branches. And um, getting the, keeping this main, the shape of it all the time. And you can finish it off by using the big, big brush, very, very dry, to get the the frothy Just little. The yes. 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 And that's that's so almost absolutely dry. But using just, it very delicately. I yes. Suppose. Very hardly touching the paper. You yes. see, and you get this sort of feeling of the fine twigs, which you couldn't go to go go on with with the. Uh, the rigger. You can go so far with a rigger, but basically you've got there we are, you've got mm. a winter tree. Yes. You and really in seconds you, you, you don't have to take a lot of trouble over it. But at least you've got the um, contrast in yes. now we've got to say another one over there, which is a sort of Scots pine, I think mm. it is. I'm not very well on names, but um, again you, you make up your, your branches trunk and then your branches are going down at a different angle here you've got mm. this top, top notch 
bit there and You're really using that brush at an angle, aren't you? Yes, you're, you're making the very most of it. Um, you can get the char it. character of it, you see. Here's, here's the next one to it. There's a little group, group there. And then you use a fine rigger to put these, these branches in here. Just giving an impression, isn't well, it? Well, really, that's what we're after. It's like a cartoon, you know. You can show some yes. uh, some, some person's um, a character. Oh, you can recognise who it is. Yes. You see how yes. how fast this big one will put put foliage in. Yes. See. And there's that nice delicate bit here again. You should be able to recognise the um, breed of tree. Yes. yes. I think. Well, the thing you need with, with skies and clouds is, is courage. So many people paint these poor, weak little skies, a little bit frightened of them, so they put a, a weak little wash on them. And of course, um, by the time they finish the paint the rest of the picture, the, the, the sky's gone back and they're so disappointed with it. You've got to frighten yourself with the sky. I mean, I often paint a, a sky in front of a, an audience, like, you know, and I'm doing demonstrations. And everybody goes, oh, you know, they're, they're, they see this great big, strong, rich uh, mauve uh, carry on for a thunderous cloud, and, and you know, they think, um, oh, I've ruined it. But you've got to frighten yourself and put more on than you think. You know, I put lots of uh, piles of paint on my palette and, and drop it in and, and have a really good go with it. Well, all I try to do with my painting, as you see, from the title of the film, is, is um, painting pure and simple. In other words, I've got a very simple philosophy, which is to take, um, simplify your subject in front of you and paint it in a pure way, with as few strokes as possible. I know I've said this before, but I think watercolour is so much like golf. Uh, the fewer such strokes you use, the more, um, the more professional it looks. Um, so my principles, uh, if people follow that, it doesn't mean they paint like me. Nobody goes away painting like me. I wouldn't want them to. They wouldn't want to do. But it, it's giving them a set of simple rules to, to follow, which are common sense. Nobody can argue against purity or simplicity. Hundreds, thousands of better artists than I am, but I think what I'm trying to do is to communicate this excitement that I have and, and uh, I, I feel this is my purpose in life, if you like. Right, let's have a look at some of your pictures now. Uh, first of all, this one. Oh, um, that's the trouble. You see, as you're looking at the picture, your eyes zooming out yes, to the corner. If you'd, I mean, it's much diverse. better. You imagine that without that. Um, I know what you're thinking is you ought to have something in interest, yes, but the yes. point is that's where all that, that, that's how there was nothing on that side. No, of it. well that's the uh, that's where all the action is. You see, uh, you don't need this because your eye doesn't quite know which to look at. You yes. see, that would be a nice bit, just plain, lovely sky mm. there. It's very nice. Yeah. Now this one, um, like your sky, like the background. You see, that won't be not wet into wet. It wants to be a bit mm. sharper to bring it yes. away from all that. Yes. Um, and then you should have some of the reflections of that into the uh, into the water there, that colour. So you and think on this side it should be a little bit sharper altogether? Yes. And this, of course, the usual trouble yeah, with yeah. most people, they muddy. make the foreground mm. too muddy. Yeah, yes. yeah that's it. And it's just it's too, too, too much mud. Yeah. This one, again, it's a nice one. The only thing I can see really wrong with it is that your tone of your roof there is much too near the 
near the tone of, of the hillside. So, so I should have made it lighter. Yes, if you half yes. close your eyes, you can see these faults. You see, you say, oh, well, that's a red roof, but it's a... But if you look at the thing with the eyes half closed and it disappears... It's the tone that's important it's rather tone than the colour. That's right, yes. Um, the thing is, you've got a lot of complicated bits going on there, you see. Now, you should have had this fairly plain. Mm. It's no good having two lots of complicated bits. But I bits. find it difficult if you've got a... Compli you know, it, it was a complicated foreground yeah. with all sorts of bits of debris and so on. Yeah. It's very tempting. To oh, very it. tempting. This is what you've got to really um, use a lot of self-control there because you can see all the fuss going on. That's great. But there, you've got a lot of fuss going on here as well. Mm. So you've got one competing with the other, yes. you see? Yes. Right. Now, this one, you've got an awful lot of things competing for your mm. attention. Mm. There's nothing there that's really dominant. You know, that fights that, that fights that, and that. So you've got things all dotted all over. Yes. yes. I mean, yes. what you should have done was either put a, a much bigger boats in there so that you... Uh, um, they're the dominant thing. Mm. But you can see now your Probably eyes... don't need the rocks at all. You don't. No, you see, again, you could have had a bit of peace there. Mm. People think, well, you've got to fill space up yes. with something. Yes. Uh, lovely sky, beautiful sky, but again, if you're going to have something, um, you've got to have something dominant in the picture. And at the moment, you've got about four or five things mm. competing for a dominant. So your eyes mm. bobbing about there, not quite sure what to do. Maybe I should have made those houses more recessive and vague. Yes, that's right, or make those bigger. Mm. Yeah, and, and certainly get rid of those rocks because mm. it's okay. Mm. Great, that's fine. Very really interesting. Okay, thank you. Pick it up a second. Mm. Wow. Um, anyway, I'll turn it over and put it back in the Good. And you put the backing sheet on. And whip these bits in here. Now, let's have a look. Oh, marvellous. That's it. Let the audience, your, your audience, do some work for themselves. Don't treat them like idiots. Don't spoon feed them. Let them go halfway and say, that's my impression. Then they, they, they do the rest of their um, um, work themselves. It's like a radio play, you know, they just give you the, the voices and the rest of the um, thing is um, you've got to create the characters yourself. Now, people who want to look at pictures like to do something of themselves. I think the main thing you need about watercolour is, is courage. You know, just don't be frightened of it. It's only a bit of paper. And I think the, the final words are uh, simplicity and purity. Keep it simple and keep it pure. OK? Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. Lovely something. Yeah.